Welcome, everybody, to today's Mentor Time topic of the week. Today, I want to talk about strengthening your results and your writing by reframing caveat clauses. clauses. So let's get started. Check yourself. Do you know what a caveat clause is? Maybe pause for a minute and think about it. Well, let me give you some examples. The top left is a business example that um, I found on uh, something that someone sent me about some marketing they were doing. The other two are from research, an area that I know well because this is a discipline I worked in for many years. And these are the kinds of clauses I call caveat clauses. But really a caveat clause is taking us back now to Grammar 101. It's a dependent clause. So let's review. And in this review, as I often do, I do research on the topic. I discovered uh, that there are three kinds of caveat clauses or dependent clauses, I should say. And the one that applies to caveat clauses are adverbial dependent clauses. These start with words like even though, because, if, and also in the world I worked in, in many, for many years in research and evaluation, they start with despite or while, things that um, emphasize some limitation. The important thing about adverbial dependent clauses or caveat clauses is that the information that comes first is not important or it's not as important as the main part of the sentence, which you may remember is called the independent clause that can stand alone by itself. Why do I emphasize this? I emphasize it because if you aren't writing in a very strong way with what you lead and the results that you show, you come off as very weak and starting with your weak phrase, leaves people thinking you're weak and not focusing on the second half of the sentence. So let's look through a few of how you can lead with you, your results and your achievements really show. In this first example on the top left, you see that I reframed what the person wrote to see is continuing to focus because she already had experience in this on these areas and uh, linked it in the dependent clause to when she started working with a, a, a global organization uh, to do some research in, on a particular topic area. So you're seeing that she's focusing now, not her primary focus is, which doesn't give you any sense of results or a previous experience. The bottom right then talks about someone who worked at a global organization in three different countries. That's important, but that's not as important as what he did, where he led results-based activities, where he gave the numbers of people he helped uh, the country reach. And then at the end of the sentence are the descriptors about the context he did it in, three different countries and the organization that he worked for. A couple more. Um, and I've made the um, blank um, underlines to show you how many words I might be taking out. So in the top right one, I took out six or seven words that describe the program. This person said she um, the, that this person designed and implemented a, uh, a system for. Instead, though, what I really discovered is she actually established the program and then made all these changes that benefited people. So. You see how we're leading with what she did. She established it, not that she's designing a new system. That's part of it, but it was only one part of it. And finally, the example on the right is a very long convoluted, that's one whole sentence. All those, that top italics on the right is one sentence. I broke it up and also then framed it so the person that is describing herself is talking about being a global lead. She was well known and is well known on the global stage for this kind of work. And rather than her starting with coordinating donor inputs across these countries, it's really leading, getting this program rolled out, getting everybody's cooperation. And I split it up into um, two or three different sentences. They're still long, they need more work, but this can show you how we reframed it initially. 
So I want to stop here. This is your turn to try this out. So why don't you put this recording on pause and see what kinds of rewording you can come up with. This will give you good practice for when you're uh, looking at your CV and resume and cover letter, trying to reframe your results and achievements. Okay, how did you do? So the top um, left dependent clause is not so much a, a limitation, but gives you a sense of timeline. But that wasn't so important as the successful consultancy with a 60% return rate. And we did mention for almost a decade. The bottom left is a person who's an epidemiology fellow at CDC. And this isn't a full-time, this is full-time work, but it's a two-year fellowship. So she didn't say she was an employee. Um, and she wanted to leave in fellowship because it is very prestigious. But what she really did is lead the um, work on analyzing and disseminating data from a national survey. She needs to mention what the national survey's title is so people understand the volume and the, the size of this data set. But we also mentioned she's doing other work in her two-year fellowship, again, strengthening her results and achievements. And on the right is a person who does research and research uh, uh, very well. She wanted to also get credit or identify that she could do statistical analyses. It led to a very confusing sentence where she was trying to jumble everything into one sentence. So I've split this into three sentences where she talks about the way in which she's implemented um, these research projects in different countries with different teams, then the kinds of work that she can do in analytics, and finally, demonstrating her communication skills, oral and written, with how she publishes, writes reports, and presents at conferences to disseminate the findings. So as we finish up, we're going to remember, put your caveat clauses in their place. They belong at the end or in another sentence. And I thought you might be interested, the information I give, gave you from Grammar 101, the author wrote three tips. And I don't know whether it was irony or he did it um, because he's used to writing this way, but his third tip was phrased with the dependent clause coming first. And um, for me, not being very helpful, just say dependent clauses aren't essential, but they give you more helpful information. As always, thanks a lot for coming to our topic of the week. Drop me a comment below in the um, comment area. Reach out to me for anything you need and find me in YouTube. Subscribe if you uh, want a weekly topic notification and we'll see you on topics in the future. Thank you.